Chris Phil Ferguson. Hello. Ooh, it works. How y'all doing? That was, that was pretty good. Let's try again. Good morning. Yeah. We are going to have some fun today, so I hope you are all ready. Uh, just a little personal notes. I bought a house yesterday. Bad news, now I own two. So uh, a little later, we are going to have some fun, so I'm just making sure everything is here. Um, I had a little fun experience two days ago, I guess, on my drive through Missouri. We're in this town called Rolla. Have you ever heard of it? Nice place. Uh, I was listening to Christian radio because I was feeling kind of sleepy and they pissed me off and I can't sleep when I'm pissed. Just ask my wife. <laughs> um, and there's this lady on, named Karen and she's asking for money. They play a song, really sappy, I love Jesus song and then they beg for money and then Jesus is wonderful, can do anything except for print money, send us some money. <laughs> and at some point she says, everyone listening to this radio station should call and donate money. If you're not if you're listening and not donating money, I want you to call and explain to me why you're not donating money. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> so I called, and the person answered the phone and said, are you calling to make a donation? And I said, no, uh, Karen asked me to call. <laughs> they seemed a little confused, but they fetched Karen for me. And Karen comes on the phone, and she says, can I help you? And I said, you asked me to call you. And I was waiting for her to say something like, oh, a gift from God. But uh, I explained that I wasn't donating money, and she asked me to call. She said, well, why not? And I said, well, I'm an atheist. Said, really? <laughs> and I said, matter of fact, I'm driving to Springfield, Missouri, where 1,500, mostly, I know a couple of you may not be, but we'll work on that, 1,500 atheists are going to be at attendance for a convention called Skepticon. Really? I said, yes, and matter of fact, I am a speaker at this convention. And she said, well, what's your talk on? I said, how to get kids out of religion. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> well, about 15 minutes later, after a song finishes, she comes back on the radio, and she says, people, I need to talk to you about something. I just had this very disturbing call from someone who's rejected Jesus. And he has told me that in Springfield, Missouri, this weekend, there are 15,000 atheists. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I did not say 15,000. I, I know I said 1,500. She was off by a factor of 10, but I thought, Christian, factor of 10, that's pretty fucking accurate. <laughs> and I just realized I didn't plug in my little uh, controller, so. I'm going to roam a little bit. Uh, while I'm doing that, uh, since this is Sunday morning, we are going to have communion. And I have uh, two ushers that have agreed to help me. If they can please come to the uh, altar here. And uh, right in the center, gentlemen. We've we got to be balanced in the eyes of the Lord. That's just kind of how it works. Not my rules, sorry. We'll, we'll get that here in a second. What we have um, for you is we have Mentos for 1,000. So they are going to pass out Mentos. This is going to be your holy sacrament. If you want to imagine that it turns into a piece of an ancient dead man, just for memory's sakes, go for it. Go forth. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, something, something, something. Okay. And then, uh, instead of wine, can I, can I have one of those? I need to save one out. I'm prepared. You will see this in action before the day is over, before the hour is over. 
Lauren said it was okay. Where did she leave? Good. It, it, it's, it's good. Trust me. Uh, the talk is Breaking the Cycle. We're at Skepticon 5. Uh, welcome. My business website is polarisfinancialplanning.com. It's on the screen in case you can't hear me for some strange reason. I have to tell you, because the state of Illinois strongly recommends that I tell you, that I am a registered investment advisor with the state of Illinois. As soon as I tell you that I'm registered with the state of Illinois, I basically have to tell you that it doesn't mean shit. They don't endorse me, they don't approve of me. I just basically filled out a 30-page form that they required me to fill out, and they said I did a good job. So I get a little star. This is my blog, Skeptic Money. If you don't read any blogs, come to mine. If you do read blogs, come to mine. Uh, my new thing is a pink atheist pod podcast with Rachel and Jimmy, and our, right over here, give them a hand. And our, we have a live show Sunday from 3 to 5 Central, and our mission is to lift all boats. We all believe strongly that atheists should do less fighting and should do more promoting of each other. So uh, if you are doing anything in the movement, we'd love to have you on. Are there leftovers? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for those who showed up late, screw them. Uh, one of my big things is to, is it's great that you come to conventions, and I'm so delighted that you made it at 9.30. Thank you very much. Uh, but you need to go out and do something. Call people like Karen on the Christian radio station. Rattle her cage a little bit. I, I swear after she got done telling the story, I was waiting for her to break down and start crying because she was nervous, shaken. Uh, go do things in the community, whether it's helping a food bank, picking up the side of a road. It doesn't have to be a lot. Meeting in the pubs is awesome, but you need to go out and do something. One of the things that I've done, and I wanted to talk to you about it for just a moment, is being involved with this event. The first year they had about 150 people, and Lauren can correct me if I get this wrong. Second year, about 300 people. The third year, they were maxed out with a room that had 500 people. JT put out a call and said, we need help. The problem is people come and donate money but we need the money in advance to get this beautiful place for Skepticon 3. So I called him and I said, how much do you need? He told me. <laughs> and after I picked myself up off the floor, I said, do you think you're gonna get it back when people donate? And he says, yes. And I said, okay, I will give you the money. And Skepticon 3 exploded from 500 people to 1,000 people. And to this day still, I consider that one of the best investments I've ever made in my life. 500 extra people got to come to a free convention. Now, while it is free and it is growing because we went to 1,100 and hopefully today we'll get to 1,500, PZ asked if the room would be filled. And I said, when are you talking? <laughs> so, so about seven o'clock tonight, this place is gonna be standing room only. It is free, but we need your money. And this is something that the Christians are kicking our ass doing, asking for money. So if you have no money and you just barely made it here with the gas in your tank, it's all good. But if you have some money, and I know some of you do, share a little. This convention might have cost you four or $500 if it was somewhere else. 100 bucks, a couple hundred bucks, 1,000 if you want. Just something to think about. Uh, this is my little reminder. Usually when you go to a play or a theater or something like that, they tell you to make sure you pull out your phones and turn them off. I want you to pull out your phones and make sure you turn them on. I want you to go to Twitter if you have a Twitter account. And yes, I do want you to do this right now, so I should see some movement. Pretend like you're doing something. And we are going to try a little social experiment. Instead of having a great big Christian radio station, with 18 towers all across Missouri reaching a couple million people, we own the web. So I'm gonna suggest and ask you to do a group tweet that we're gonna send out all of us at the same time and just blow up the phones of everybody who's not here. So Skepticon 5 has started. 
and you are missing it. The first speaker is amazing. <laughs> Just saying. You should follow at Skeptic Money. Now, our goal in this experiment is for me to add 1,000 Twitter followers. So let's see if you can do it. And if you feel the necessity, go ahead and add. Shameless. And Uh, a little bit about my story to, to give you some uh, perspective from where I'm coming from. You know, as an average kid growing up in a Methodist church, uh, which I've since learned is basically Christianese for pussy, uh, I believed in Bigfoot and aliens, and I loved those shows on TV, just like people love the ghost hunter shows today, which I can't wrap my head around. And they tell us about this guy, the Jesus of love, and how wonderful he was. I'm sorry, not this guy, this guy, the Jesus of love, buddy, buddy Jesus. <laughs> and he's all good, and the Bible's not literal, and it doesn't really mean what people think it means, and we all go to heaven. Then I ran into this guy. I still remember having to go to my parents' bedroom and watch Cosmos once a week for an hour on a nine inch black and white TV, because that's all we had. Because the big TV, the 19 inch behemoth in the family room, was tuned to Love Boat. <laughs> and this was the highlight of my week, each and every week was watching this show. And even today I get emotional thinking about it, because it changed my life. But then I had my fall, I went back to church. I got married. We had a kid. Everybody in the family wanted the kids baptized. It's a little spritz of water. Meaningless, trivial event. Sure, why not? Apparently, most churches don't want to just give out free baptisms. You have to be a member. So we join. I'll just pretend. No big deal. We do the baptism. Next thing you know, we put the kids in the preschool because in our society, doesn't apparently value preschool enough to to set it up for everybody, so you have to go to a church to get preschool. And then they went to the Christian school, because it was attached to the preschool, and they already knew the kids and the teachers. And, um, the school was about to go bankrupt, so I went to the board meeting to make some suggestions, and they basically said, if you know so much, why don't you run? I did. Uh, I spent three years on the Christian school board, as a closeted atheist, I saved the school from going bankrupt. I was there for three years. Two, as the treasurer, I have a lot of shit to make up for. <laughs> uh, when I finally got off the school board, a couple of the elders cornered me one Sunday after service, and they said, we would like you to be the outreach chair for the entire church and bring in new members to this organization. I thought, what have I done? Apparently, I was the perfect candidate. I'm relatively articulate. I have a penis. Um, <laughs> I'm white. Um, you know, so I fit the suit. Uh, so there's that. Now, the good news is that non-belief, nuns, and of course, a subset of that, atheists, are exploding. And the top number up here, my little pointer barely works, if you can see it, the unaffiliated has grown to 24%, 25% with the nuns. You also have at the very bottom this don't know what religion they are. I'd count on them too. Uh, the, the others and non-Christians, generally not our problem in America today, so we're well on our way. And it's not just this study. We have this brand new one from the American Value Survey, which shows the youngest adults, 18 to 29, 32% are unaffiliated or nuns, and they're not going to a church. They probably did as a kid because their parents took them, but now they're not. And they don't go back. This is the most important chart here from the Pew Forum. The greatest generation, the silent generation, the boomers, the Gen Xers, all of these lines, at least for as long as we have them, whatever you are by about 20, 25, 30, it doesn't change, good or bad. So this generation up here, that's 34% non-religious, they're gonna stay 34%. 
So that is fantastic. So that inspires my idea. And the churches know they have to get to the kids. Knocking on doors and converting 40-year-olds is really tough. But if you can get them in vacation Bible school or preschool, you can get them. This is a compilation that I made of that same data from Pew Forum because they used to do the survey every 15 or 20 years, and then they've changed to doing it about every five years or seven years. So when you just look at the data, it looks like it's linear growth. I want to tell you it's not linear. Now, extrapolation is always dangerous. But based on the data we already have, not only is non-religion and atheism growing, it's growing at a growing rate. Some people don't think it's a battle. I do, and we're winning the battle. I like to have fun with Christians as, as an example at radio show. So my daughter and, out, and I were out eating one time in a Chinese restaurant, and we had fortune cookies at the end, and we thought, why don't religions ever put messages in fortune cookies? And my daughter, who is way too grown up for her age, suggests that maybe they're worried about the fact that people will add, in bed. And I thought she was onto something, so on my website, skepticmoney.com, we had a little contest, and I promised to show the winners here today. So when you read these phrases, remember to add in your own head, in bed. So we have, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <laughs> Behold, I come quickly. Will a unicorn be willing to serve thee? That one worried me. Jesus wept. And I left off, but I was one of my you know, runner-ups as, uh, you know, come forth the little children or something, but uh, too Catholic. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And I had to throw in as a bonus, not one of the winners, but one of my personal favorites, just because it was non-Christian, Mohammed. Oh, see, you don't laugh at that one. Thank you. Now we're going to talk about uh, one of the tactics I use when talking to Christians. And, and like JT, who I adore, is he in here? Oh, I talked good about him, and he's not even here to see it. I love talking to Christians. Uh, every year, where is ISA? Are you guys here? This is the Illini Secular Student Alliance. They've got about 20 members here from Champaign, Illinois. And ma matter of fact, just, just hit me. Anyone who's in a college or high school group right now, please stand up and let's give them a round of applause because they are amazing. Look at this. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I have been doing this long enough where I've been at events where I was the youngest person. And sometimes by quite a lot. No, I'm not. And, and they are the future, and when we have to make sure that they succeed. Uh, I go on the campus of U of I on the quad for quad day, where they, all the students get to see all the tables. And they put their secular student table in the middle of the Christian tables, because they don't know where else to put it. So we're surrounded by Christians, and I have great conversations, and I developed this little end point where I'll talk to a Christian for a while, and when I realize that they're getting tired, and it's almost always before I am about talking about religion, and they're going to leave, I say, you know what? Let's talk about for a moment something we can agree on. We, there's certain basic morals and ethical values that we share, and we should focus on those things and make sure that we build on that. And they said, yeah, yeah, that's great. I said, so let me give you a scenario. You're in a dark alley in the middle of a foreign country. You can't speak the language. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. You don't even know how you got there. You're all alone. And you're very concerned and very worried. And out of the darkness comes an ogre, eight feet, two inches tall, 450 pounds of muscle, except for the beer belly. But ignore that. And he grabs you from behind and lifts you off the ground. And that's with one arm. You are in big, serious trouble. And you can't move. And with his free hand, he puts up to the side of your head a gun. And he leans over to your ear and he whispers, do you love me? And you're in such shock that the ogre explains to you that if you love him, he will make you a cake. And if you don't love him, he's going to shoot you in the head and turn you into a zombie. <laughs> so 
So the big question is, is this moral? And every single time I've talked to a Christian about this, they say, no, the ogre is not moral. The ogre is behaving immorally. And I said, see, there's basic human values that we agree on, whether we're religious or not religious. Now, some of you may see where this is going, but some of you may not. The Christians don't. I said, let's change the rules a little bit. No, let's not change the rules. Let's change the parameters. Let's just magnify them. Instead of the ogre building you a cake, he lets you live in a place of beauty and grace for all of eternity. And if you don't love him, he's going to send you into a lake of fire where you will burn over and over for all of eternity. And they say, oh, well, now you're talking about Christianity. And I say, we agree twice. That's magical. And they go, but that's different. I, I just don't understand. Uh, often at that point, they say something like, I, I got to go. And they stumble off. And maybe it's just me being sadistic and poking fun at them or making them try to think. But I'd like to think, and maybe this is just self-delusion, at some point they go, damn, he had a point. Other atheists will tell me that we should just be quiet and, and stay in our rooms. And I say, we tried that for 1,800 years, and it didn't fucking work. So I'm just saying. After that, I figured we needed something fun and lighthearted. <laughs> so now we're going to get into a little bit of the meat and potatoes of one of the points I want to make is how you can get to the children. And the first time I gave this talk, I was very concerned because I had never seen anyone do it before. And atheists um, just 30, 40 years ago were you know, mostly retired people that were free to say what they wanted to say and didn't have to worry about losing their jobs. And now I'm taking it full circle and I'm saying, you got to get to the kids. And I don't mean just your kids. I mean your nieces and nephews, your younger siblings, your neighbor's kids. You have to keep in mind what you can get away with personally without putting your life in jeopardy or perhaps the child's. Um, I had some neighbor boys come over, that, and they know me, and they know I'm an atheist. I answer the door with the Richard Dawkins A shirt on. And one of the boys says, uh, oh, you're the atheist, right? He may have never met an atheist knowingly if I hadn't been open. And he said, but atheism is just another religion. And inside, I'm screaming. <laughs> and I want to grab him and go, you stupid. <laughs> but instead, I said, you know, that's a very thoughtful question. Um, I think I can explain why that's not true if you'll give me a couple minutes. Do you guys want to come inside? <laughs> sure, okay. So they came inside, and we sat in my office, and I showed them uh, the Brick Testament Bible. Is, is Brandon here? He's out there selling books. Go buy some. Oh, I, I love his work, the Lego Bibles. Can't get enough of it. And I showed them things online. I gave them each a free copy of a Gideon's Bible, because you get one free with each night's stay. I figure I cost the Gideons an extra dollar every time I steal one, borrow, take one. Uh, so I want you to do things that can help. And one of the first things is Steve Spangler science. And since we're going to talk about science, I've got to get all science up in here. So you know it's real science when you got a fucking lab coat. And since I take everything too far, So, I'm shedding. Tasty. All right, I need help from Derek Miller. Where is he? Derek, come on up. Derek is the president of the Alani Secular Student Alliance, one of the best, one of the best student groups out there. And we're going to do a little experiment, and it's to illustrate the Bernoulli principle. And we've got to make sure this is ready for you. 
Uh, anyone ever heard of a diaper genie? Have you ever heard of a diaper? Nope. Don't worry about it. Oh, good. I cleaned it out earlier. It's fine. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to ask you to put your mouth on it or anything. So what I want you to do is take this open end and get some big breaths and try to fill it. I only have an hour. Come on. It's kind of limp. All right. We, we, that's four. 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 No, I'm, I'm going to try now. Okay. We're going to get all the air out so it's fair. So you can let go. Let it all out? Yeah, let it all out. All right. Thank you. It's the wig, isn't it? I'm going to try. You ready? Okay. How's that? Huh? Thank you, Derek. Give Derek a big hand. He's been very helpful. Uh, the first time I showed my kids, my daughter, who's too old for her age, says, Dad, that's one hell of a condom. I don't know. I'm going to put her in a convent. Uh, other things you can do with Steve Spangler Science, they have this neat kit uh, where you get this little nozzle and some Mentos, and all you got to do is buy your own two-liter bottle of Coke. But we're going to do that a little later, so don't, don't go anywhere. Got to keep you in the seat, so you don't want to leave early and rest to your cars to see the football game. Oh, wait, it's 10. Um, Steve Spangler Science also has books put out. They make great things. And matter of fact, often, while they're selling the products for money, they will tell you about neat tricks, like this diaper genie bag that you can go buy at a fraction of the cost. So it's not always about them making money. They really want you to teach science to kids. So I love that website. Um, we had uh, these little beads. And my daughter, a few years ago, she had all the cheerleaders from the school over to the house. And we made friendship bead bracelets. And they made them out of these white beads. So just to make sure you're awake, I'm going to throw them at you. Are you ready? They thought I was joking. Keep your eyes open. Oh, they don't go as far as I was hoping. All right, here we go. Come on. Oh, Mike was. We got farther back. Now I got it. Now we got it. All right, am I live? I'm still live. Good. So the nice thing about these bracelets is that they're all white beads until they're exposed to sunlight. Or a black. Hello. One can't see below their neck. Is that a bad sign? I think it's good. So they make these bracelets, and I tell these young ladies in the cheerleading squad, they're secret bracelets. And only they know the color combinations that they make. And they go down to the basement where there's a black light on, and they make these bracelets. They come upstairs to the house with regular lights. They turn back white. When you go outside, they turn color again. And they come up to me, these young girls who've already been taught that they're not meant for math and science, which pisses me off. And they say something like, how does that work? So simple. They want, they're asking me about the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing little things like this that you can do. And these aren't my kids. And I'm not turning them into an atheist by this little event, but I'm making them think. And I take that as a teaching moment to tell them that science is cool. <laughs> science is fun. It, it can do amazing things. You should learn more about it. Hopefully it inspires them to do something. Uh, and this kind of flows right into ask, having them ask questions. You want them to ask lots of questions. And when our kids were young, we had science-y videos on all the time. You can't take a little kid and sit them and force them to watch a science video. Even the best ones can be a little, a little dry. Not to me, but to a kid. They're very excitable, just like me. Uh, so you put them on the, in the playroom, and you just have them on. They'll soak it up. It's just like watching Sesame Street. They learn the alphabet. And we have all these dinosaur things. We have evolution box set, planet Earth, some of the most video, beautiful video photography you've ever seen in your life. Amazing. 
So you gotta teach them how the universe really works. <laughs> well, we, we can have a little fun too, can't we? Uh, just we love this show, and it's not realistic, but it's fun. So uh, it gets them to question things, and I even got my own little uh, sonic screwdriver the kids bought me for one of my birthdays. So it, it's great fun. Other things you can do, watch movies about other religions, mythologies. Teach them that Christianity is not the only religion out there. Uh, I once had a pastor from the church that I used to pretend to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Any Missouri Synod Lutherans, former Lutherans? Okay, got a few. Uh, they're nuts. <laughs> After three years of not talking to this guy, he emails me, what can we do to get you back to church? And I think I said something back slightly snarky. Uh, I would have to forget everything I know about physics, chemistry, astronomy, plate tectonics, history, biology, religion. And then you might have a fighting chance, but I'd probably still find it fucking illogical, so I don't know what you do. Um, and I asked him if the Bible was inerrant, and he said that not only is the Bible inerrant, but it's self-revealing, which I had not heard before this moment. Self-revealing means that if you were to sit down without anyone around you or, or anything to disturb you, and you just read the Bible from beginning to end, you would be a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Because it's the one true religion. And I asked him, if the Bible is self-revealing and reading it would make you a Missouri Synod Lutheran, why is 0.003% of the world's population Missouri Synod Lutheran? He stopped emailing me. <laughs> a couple of the suggestions for you. Agora, fantastic. I think, if I remember correctly, this is a Spanish movie. They spent $80 million on it. This is not a low-budget film. Could not get a distributor in the United States. Why? Because it painted Christians in a negative light I call truth. Um, you can have a little more fun with Battles, Troy, Thor. Clash of the Titans, the original, please. The new one sucked ass. I thought they had a moment where they were going to redeem themselves when they pulled, what was the little owl's name? What was it? Bobo. Bobo, thank you. And they pulled it out and I go, yes, the movie's being redeemed. It has a chance. And he goes, oh, that's some old junk. And they threw it in the crate. And I, I should have walked out then. I, I should have known. There's also TV shows. And this next one is one of my favorites. They've spent an entire decade killing false deities. Do you like this show? Now, they did not mess around, and some of my nephews, I buy them season one as a gift for their birthday when they're about 12 or 13 and they're kind of into sci-fi, hoping that they want season two, season three, or if nothing else, they see 10 or 12 episodes, whatever's in a season. Maybe it makes them think. Maybe it doesn't, but it's still a nice gift, I think. Uh, Scooby-Doo. Now... I know, and some of you will tell me, because you're atheists and you have to disagree with everything, not all Scooby-Doo's are the same. But the old school Scooby-Doo, where it was the janitor or the guy who ran the amusement park ride, it was never really a ghost. And they used comedy and levity and a few Scooby snacks to prove that it always was something explainable. And everything that happens in our world is explainable but at that moment, you may not have the information to explain it. That doesn't mean you can insert your random bullshit answer and just accept it. So it's a beautiful lesson to teach the kids. Books. There are some books out here today. And my favorite, of course, I said already, the Legos. You gotta be a little careful. <laughs> they did take out the pornography, which really kind of bummed me out. But that's free on the internet. Um, <laughs> but there's plenty of violence. So uh, get yourself a copy. The author is here. You can have him sign it. He didn't pay me to do this. I just love it that much. Here's a couple that I have in my presentation. Evolution by Daniel Loxton. Now, if you've got really hardcore, fundy families, you may not be able to get away with giving this as a gift. But if you've got a reasonably rational Christian family, you give this to a child as a gift. It is a gorgeous picture book with text explaining the basic fundamentals of how biology and evolution work. A beautiful, beautiful book. Another simply gorgeous book, The Magic of Reality. 
I think this book is age appropriate for all. If you have a toddler, you can read sections of this to them as they go to bed. If they're 8 to 12 to 15, they can read it themselves. And if you don't know the basic format, there's 12 or 13 sections, and each section picks a scientific topic like, why do we have day or night? And it discusses two or three world myths, religions, and then gives you the facts. And Christianity does not hold a special place in this book. I think it's only mentioned two or three times. So the Christian parent probably won't be bothered by it much, but the child will pick out that, hey, Christianity is just as silly as ancient Aztec religion, just as logical as Roman and Greek mythologies. Letting go of God, anybody heard this? Uh, my, my little story in this, I, I was in Arkansas for two years. Uh, I call it hell for short. Um, and my wife and kids came down for one school year because I was only there two years temporarily. And when this came out, I bought my copy right away. And it came from Amazon in a box and I opened it up. And my wife, who was a Missouri Synod Lutheran still, not anymore, but at the time, saw this and said, you're not going to play that for the kids, are you? Because religion has a special place. It can't be discussed. It can't be attacked. No. I, I wouldn't. Never. I, I, I would, not just for me. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Well, the first time me and the kids were in the car alone for two hours. <laughs> Oopsie. It's all I had. <laughs> so we listened to it. And I didn't make a big deal out of it. It's just what was on. Daddy wants to listen to this. And they were, you know, 8 or 10 or 12 at the time. And I didn't think much of it. And a few weeks later, we were driving through the backwoods of Missouri for some strange reason. And we drove by this place called Fred's Furniture. And for those of you who have see, seen this or heard this, there's a part where Julia Sweeney talks about where they made God more personable by calling him Fred. And they would say things like, Fred is love. Fred is love. So we drive by Fred's Furniture Store. And my kids, in unison, start saying, Fred's is love. Fred's is love. And I'm driving. Oh. And my wife goes, what is that all about? And my son, the truthful son of a gun, dad had us listen <laughs> to this thing by Julia Sweeney a couple of days ago. And it had this thing where God is love, but they said, Fred, I'm driving, honey. <laughs> I could go into a ditch. Don't tempt me. I found out from my son a couple years later, uh, he told me that he had serious questions and doubts about Christianity. But when this two-hour monologue finished, he knew it was a lie. You never know what's going to be that final straw. It's a beautiful, funny, touching, heartfelt story. And for my son, it was the final straw that, that uh, made it the end of religion. So I can never thank Julia Sweeney enough for that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Magic tricks. Oh, I got I to have myself. Magic tricks. I love magic tricks. And there's quite a few magicians here. Uh, yeah, lots of them. I, I know Matt Dillahunting was uh, doing a little experiment with magic last night to see how good he can be versus how drunk he can be. So <laughs> that was great. I wish I could have sit up for another hour to see it, but I had to be here for all of you. So thank you for coming early. We got our daughter a little magic wand. I, I can't remember the proper name of it. It's a paddle stick with little beads on it, anyone who does magic. And we were in a magic shop, and there's an actual magician working behind the counter showing you how it works. And man, it is amazing. You're just like, how do you do that? So we bought her one, and she pulls out the instructions. She runs to her room, and she studies the instructions. And she comes down to me, and she goes, I can't figure out how to make it work. She thought there was some kind of physical mechanism, some way to manipulate it to make it do what it looked like it was doing. And I read the instructions, and I was like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I should have known that myself, how it worked. And so I showed her, and she's like, it's just a trick. Throws it down on the table, <laughs> walks away. So I said, well, can I have it? And she goes, sure, I don't want it. So when her friends would come over, 
I'd practiced, and I would show them the trick, and they were amazed. How did you do that? How did you do that? And she's like, how, how can they fall for that? How can they not see how it works? And I go, honey, you didn't see how it worked until you saw how it worked. Can I have it back? <laughs> so for a while, she showed her friends that, and it was great fun. Uh, YouTube videos. Uh, you know, if you have the, the younger generation in particular, very video intensive. They love images, they love pictures, they love videos. Share them a funny little video. It doesn't have to be one that hits them over the head to start with, but something that'll get them to think and use your own judgment based on what you know of yourself and what you know of the young adult or the child that you're trying to get to. Thinking Atheist, fantastic high quality studio stuff. Love Seth's work. Uh, Aaron Ra, and I didn't put this in because he was going to be here, but I love Aaron's stuff. Is, is he here yet this morning? He's still sleeping off from last night, too. Uh, Dark Matter 2525 does more cartoony style. Very, very fun stuff. Mr. Deity. Yeah. I have had Christian friends watch this and just laugh their butts off. And they don't get it, but they're still hearing the message. It, it's fantastic. Uh, Atheist Experience, Matt, who was doing the magic tricks last night, uh, a couple of hours every Sunday or so, just explaining Christianity to Christians. <laughs> it's great, great fun. Uh, blogs, there's so many of them, but all you need to know about is skeptic money. <laughs> that took care of that. I got links in the sidebar if you really get bored after you read all the posts. No, I just, there's plenty of them out there. Music, Tim Minchin. <laughs> He was at the Reason Rally, of course, always great. Uh, I went and saw him in Chicago, and we stood in line. We got there really early, and I'm in the front row, and I had on a gray shirt with the Doctor Who angel on it, right? right? And the weeping angels, you know, like, like this, you know, just I'm scared to see myself in the mirror, kind of weeping angels. And he's doing his concert. About halfway through the concert, he stops, and he points right at me, and he goes, what? You, you with the blue on your shirt. What's your problem? And I'm like, he goes, you're staring at me. Stop staring at me. <laughs> so, from now on, you're scary, man. And I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> he goes, what is that on your shirt anyway? And so I'm trying to think, how do I explain this? I said, there, it's an angel. And he goes, that explains it. Nobody else knew it was a weeping angel from Doctor Who. They just heard angels, and he eviscerated me. It was great. <laughs> I thank him for that moment. Shelly Siegel. The voice of an angel. She is fantastic. Uh, we had here last night George Robb. Did a great job. And if you don't know Roy Zimmerman, you should learn him. He does more political stuff, but still religion. Very, very clever and witty, just like George Robbs. Matter of fact, all four of them, just brilliant. Uh, Mentos, you ready? Mentos, are you ready? See, Lauren thought I would actually do it on the stage. I mean, the Mentos thing. <laughs> we could do it outside. Yeah, but, oh. <laughs> Are you thirsty? Yeah. Well, I walked in, and the first guy gave me a million dollars. Did you guys get your million dollars? If you came late, you may have run out. I got a million dollars. Oh, there's something else in the back. And then there's a second guy who says, uh, just ask me, I'll pray for you. And I said, I'm giving a speech in half an hour. Will you pray for my speech? No. Guess I'm fucked. I'm going to hell. So you get the idea on that, that this is good fun. And if the kids have never seen that, it opens up those questions. How does that work? What makes that happen? And you can actually get the Mythbusters episode where they do that, and they built this special nozzle where they got it like 35 feet or something, a custom-built nozzle. Just great fun and experiment with chemistry. Optical illusions. A friend of mine, really kind of sad in a way, but not for him so much, but his mom was Jehovah's Witness, and I think there was five siblings in his family, him and four brothers and sisters. All four of his brothers and sisters joined Jehovah's Witness, 
and then realized that I was crap. Their mother will not talk to them. She will not open their letters. She will not recognize them if she sees them on the street. She will not acknowledge their existence forever. He became an atheist before he joined Jehovah's Witness and never joined. She talks to him all the time because there's still hope for him. Her four other children had the truth and walked away from it. The only logical explanation for that is that they're possessed by evil spirits. And she doesn't want to risk being possessed by an evil spirit so she can't communicate with them. Anyway, I get off the side. So one of the things that got him into this, which made me think of the story, is he loved optical illusions. And he made a point of showing them to people that things aren't always what they seem. Another way to get young adults, children to think. So I have this picture of a famous actress. And, you know, beautiful as always, until you change the picture just a little. Did you catch that? Let's go back. The entire time, her eyes and mouth were upside down. But when the picture was upside down, your brain fixed it for most of you. Some of you saw it right away. But as it turns, something in your brain goes, something's wrong, and there's a point where all of a sudden it becomes wrong. And so again, it's a great example, and there's lots of optical illusions you can share that show people that things aren't always what they seem. So I love these interactive kind of things. Legos, right? Lego porn. <laughs> Sadly, to get Brandon to get his books published, I talked to him yesterday. He had to take out the porn. So I have some for you here. Uh, this guy on the ground is a drunk lot. Sodom and Gomorrah, remember that? Wife turned to a pillar of salt, or as Julia Sweeney would say, the only way to get away from her husband. Uh, they went and ran and hid in a cave, and the daughters were just bereft that their father had no children. They were women. They don't count. Bible lesson one. Women don't count in the Bible. All they're good for is fucking and making babies. And so what did they do? They get their daddy drunk. The older sister has sex with them. The next day she tells the younger sister, hey, it was a pretty good time. You should try it. So Blondie has a go. And they both bear him heirs, so he has sons now. Yay for Lot. The most moral man in all of Sodom and Gomorrah, the only man worthy of being saved, sleeps with his own kids. Unacceptable today, perhaps. Uh, this is the story of Moses. At some point, you see him in the background there, God. Yahweh. This pointer's not bright enough. He shows up. He's pissed at Moses for some reason. He's going to smite him with a lightning bolt, because that's what gods did back then. And Moses is like, oh, no, don't kill me, please. And Zephorah, his wife, says, I know how to protect my husband. She grabs her little boy, rips off his pants, picks up a sharp rock from the ground, and rips the skin off the tip of his dick and goes and rubs it on Moses' foot. And God goes, well, shucks. I can't kill him now. <laughs> and he leaves. As JT would say, dear Christian, this is fucked up. Right? I was going to ask JT to marry me today. <laughs> I'm too late. Uh, teach them about different cultures, different religions around the world. Uh, the more they know, the sillier Christianity think it looks. Uh, we live in a little small town that we're just moving out of. That's why we bought the new house. They live what I call a 15-mile lifestyle. And anything beyond that 15 miles is a foreign land. They got their church, they got their family, they got their friends. They don't need to know anything else. That scares me. Do not underestimate the power of religion to get to the kids. I started off as a hardcore atheist, just letting my kids get sprinkled with some water. I didn't pay enough attention. I blame myself. And a few years later, when I came back out and told my kids, and I think they were 9 and 10 at the time, my daughter in classical style for her, eh, <laughs> whatever. My son literally cried for 24 hours. He did not sleep that night. 
because when we were both dead, I would not be with him in heaven. And I let it get that far, and I didn't even know it. So you can do things to help kids that you know, that you're related to, that are neighbors. It's really important. Um, and I thank you for your time.